This is Ethan Sawyer, a.k.a. College Essay Guy, and my goal is to bring more ease, joy, and purpose into the college application process. Welcome to the College Essay Guy podcast, where I interview some of the most brilliant minds in the college admissions world, try and tease out their genius, and then try and break down that genius into practical, actionable steps that you can take, whether you're applying to college yourself or helping someone else apply. My goal here is to go beyond the obvious and beyond the basics. Why? Because honestly, you can Google the basics. You can find that just about anywhere. Here, I'm interested in next level stuff. So I'm always striving to find the more efficient, more creative, more fun way of doing something. Whether it's showing you how to develop a college list in one day or how to improve a personal statement in 20 minutes, both of which you'll learn how to do on this podcast. Now, normally I'll be interviewing admissions professionals, but I wanted to start with a student named Daishi Tanaka for a few reasons. Number one, he's an incredible human being with an inspiring story, which you'll soon hear. Number two, he happens to be undocumented. And under the new administration, a lot of questions have been coming up for students and parents and even teachers and counselors. Big things like, you know, what does this mean in terms of changes? And more specific things like should students reveal themselves as undocumented in their personal statements? So I wanted to interview Daishi to get his perspective on this since he's on the front lines of this debate. And just on a human level, I wanted to find out from Daishi what it's like living as an undocumented college student under a Trump administration while attending Harvard University. So quick side note, there are many wonderful colleges out there and Harvard is just one of them. One of my goals on this podcast is to introduce you to some of the non-Ivy League schools that are really great. But I elected to start with Daishi and he just happens to attend Harvard. So... This is also a special episode because it's a two-part episode, and in the next episode, I interview Dr. Eliza Gilbert, who's a 2017 Counselors That Change Lives recipient, whose dissertation examined how high schools influence an undocumented student's college search. She also talks about how counselors and teachers can advocate for undocumented students, so be sure to check it out. On this episode, the one you're about to listen to, we discuss, among other things, what a typical day is like for a Harvard student. Uh, we talk about what it might mean for Daishi and 700,000 plus undocumented students if the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, that's called DACA, policy is repealed. We talk about what he wrote his college essay on and why. Uh, what he felt like he really nailed in the college application process, and how he stays calm and centered. You can find all the show notes at collegeessayguy.com slash podcast, where I'll share all the links and resources that we mentioned in the interview. So feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. You can also follow me on Twitter at College Essay Guy and the Facebook. So without further ado, let's get into the show. My guest today is Daishi Tanaka. He's currently a sophomore at Harvard studying government. And uh, Daishi and I met when he was in high school. So this would have been, you know, like two and a half or maybe even three years ago. Daishi was, um, uh, took one of my online courses and we got to know each other. And he's kind of an amazing human being. And I hope I don't embarrass you here, Daishi, but I wanted to just say like, just one example of his amazingness, um, his high school uh, they lost their counselor kind of through, was that through your junior year? Was that when that happened? Yeah, uh, yeah kind of sophomore through junior year, definitely. Sophomore, junior year. And so what does Daishi do? He steps up and he's like, well, I'll do the job of the counselor. So he <laughs> basically went online and researched, you know, all that needed researching and sort of, and helped a lot of, a lot of students through the process. And, um, you know, he's also a head of an organization that would, that he'll tell you about. Um, in a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm just really honored, Daishi, to have you and, and really grateful that you agreed to, to do the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to um, talk to you and also talk to everyone listening. Yeah. So today, you know, I want to talk about your process in terms of what it was like applying to college. I want to talk a little bit about what it's like. Well, let's start with there. Like, what's it okay. like being at Harvard? I know that I kind of <laughs> pulled a curve there, <laughs> but what's it like? Like, give me your, give me your typical day. You know, we're recording this on a Sunday. What is your typical day at Harvard like? Okay. Um, I think Sundays are very varied. Um, but I would start with like the Monday cause Mondays are the usual, um, Great. suspect of the daily routine. But, um, I would wake up around, um, nine o'clock, um, get breakfast, um, head to a class and, you know, just go to classes, um, work in between and, uh, you know, get your meals 
How is the food, by the way? How, what's a Harvard breakfast like for you? A Harvard breakfast. So uh, as an upperclassman, you don't really get a glorious breakfast, unlike you do the freshman. Um, uh, so, you know, a Harvard breakfast for me would just look like, you know, yogurt, some, um, you know, ham, some eggs. That's about it. Um, uh, but, you know, I would try to get a great lunch there. You know, Harvard has an amazing dining hall, especially with a meal plan that you get unlimited access to all the foods anytime. And so it, it's really nice. Wow. And you say anytime it's open like 24 hours or? Oh, um, actually there is like a certain time restriction. Gotcha. Um, so every meal they're open around, um, for like two, three hours every meal. So it's not that bad. Um, and yeah, they feed, they keep us well fed as I have gained some pounds over the years. <laughs> <laughs> did you gain the freshman 15 when you got to school? Yeah, I definitely did, which is not, you know, a good thing for me, but at the same time, I was happy that I would be I was being well fed. So, yeah. But for yeah. those who don't know, the freshman fifteen, by the way, is like well, you can tell them what is the freshman fifteen, Daishi. So basically, as you enter college and um, you are um, you know eating the dorm food and college food, uh, you tend to gain weight because it's a completely different type of cuisine that you're eating, and it's a type of it's a different type of frequency um, of eating, and so you end up gaining some weight, and hopefully, and it starts to go down as you enter a fresh a sophomore year because you realize that wow, I got fat and I need to work out. <laughs> And yeah, so that's what the freshman 15 is. Awesome. All right. So take us, keep going through your day. What do you, so you go to class. What do, what classes are you taking right now? Um, so currently um, on Mondays, I take a, um, a sophomore tutorial on government. Uh, it's a, t- a tutorial on democracy. So on Mondays I w- at 1.30, I would enter this big lecture hall um, from renowned professors that switch up each week. Um, the last uh, week we had a professor teach us about um, political philosophy, um, dating the differences between the ancients and the modern conceptions of democracy, which is really fascinating. Um, so that's about Monday, but I'm also taking other courses. Like I'm taking a graduate uh, seminar in the education school in the university about immigration policy and contemporary uh, edu- uh, education uh, reform. And so um, really interesting courses. Um, another class I'm taking is Spanish uh, because I, lo- I want to um, perfect my Spanish. But my last class, which is probably the most interesting and the most sought after at Harvard, um, is called Xbox 40, which is a public speaking um, class. And every week um, you give a speech or you learn tips on, on how to speak to a group of people. And it translates to a sort of uh, tutorial on not only talking in front of a crowd, but learning how to be mindful of your body as you speak. Mm. And it is definitely a class that um, is very sought after. And I was very lucky to have been able to take it as a sophomore. Awesome. Uh, so what are, what are, what's, what's, what's a typical evening like for you at school? Um, A typical evening might consist of, um, you know, going to my residential dining hall, um, eating a meal with my closest friends and roommates, um, and then, you know, playing a a game of pool um, in the lounge area, playing some ping pong, um, and then really getting into the the you know down and dirty with the with the studying and the work. So (laughs) I would trek to the library or just trek to um, my dormitory. And maybe until midnight-ish, I would, uh, we would just all work and hustle quietly and humbly. And then <laughs> <laughs> Is Harvard easier or harder than you thought it was going to be? It is 500% more harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> really? Yes. Um, Say more. Wow. I mean, I think that um, Harvard has been definitely one of the most challenging um, places I've ever been. Um, not. It's not, I mean... Yes, the studying and the actual work is difficult, but for me, it's about learning how to be um, a, I guess, a free agent, if you will, uh, with all these variables, with adulthood, you know, finding career opportunities, finding internship opportunities, let alone finding yourself within the world that you're in. It's a very fascinating place uh, filled with people that are world class and have amazing passions. Um, And so you learn how to discover yourself in a sense that um, you try to find what you love, how do you stand out, 
um, and find appreciation for the inherent qualities that you possess. Um, those really intangible things that you learn are what really challenges me every day besides the schoolwork. Wow. What surprised you? Did anything surprise you about school? Anything that you didn't expect? Um, I think, so especially at Harvard, um, you know, back in my home, uh, hometown and back in high school, um, I was relatively one of the more, I guess, you know, talented or more hardworking, more gifted, as, you know, teachers might say. And mm. so I definitely thought, wow, I have some, some sort of confidence that I can, um, you know, derive my confidence from. Um, and, 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 but coming into Harvard where you, um, you know, I definitely thought I was the lowest of the low and, um, you definitely, that was a big surprise. Uh, I guess the social academic atmosphere in relation to your peers, that was a huge surprise. Um, mm -hmm. but then, you know, what even surprised me more was how I navigated around that, um, you know, which was through self-reflection um, evaluating my inherent qualities as a human being, not as a student, but as, you know, a friend, um, you know, a 19 year old teenager, you know, those, those things really help me overcome those sense of, um, insecurities to find what I feel is what I can be proud of about myself. Yeah. Wow. What, what helped you? What, uh, whether it was resources or books or I don't know if you went to any groups or anything. What what helped you through that self reflection process, or was it all just a solo endeavor? Um, you know, just with any other things in life, I mean, uh, most a, a large chunk and most of it's just a solo reflection, a uh, solo endeavor. But um, what that what, what all the fruits of the of, you know self reflecting, um, you know, it, it was rooted in you know my the community that I've built at Harvard, definitely. Um, so. What I mean by my community is, you know, my roommates who are my best friends, um, who come from all walks of life, teaching me different perspectives and um, helping me understand the intangible qualities that I've gained from my own experiences, therefore making my own qualities that I have externally gained um, a salient factor in my life. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, a community um, of undocumented students at Harvard uh, students who have shared uh, and uh, my uh, similar experiences and can empathize with a lot of the things that I've gone through to be to the place that I am today. That so this sort of the people at Harvard have supported me through this process, um, and all of those experiences, you know, I've really make it. Um, I really, I guess, digest it in the self reflection time and just uh, solo journey throughout throughout the throughout the years. Yeah. What's it like being an undocumented student at Harvard? So uh, being an undocumented student at Harvard, uh, you know, many times you can feel alone. Uh, many times you can feel a little bit out of place. Um, reason being is that the majority of the demographic uh, population at Harvard, uh, you know, comes from more um, affluent, more um, privileged backgrounds. And so um, it's very easy to feel like, wow, other people are doing a lot more things that I can't do, um, not by academic or social reasons, but just legal reasons. And mm. you can feel those, um, you know, things that you can't do. But um, yeah, what are some of those things? Like, how is your life different from you feel like the average Harvard student? Well, I guess on a day to day level, being undocumented, you know, one of the things about being undocumented is that you're most more likely to, you know, be of a lower socioeconomic um, status coming in. And so not having that sort of academic rigor, uh, rigorous education, um, not having those skills from a prestigious high school um, kind of, you know, uh, puts a disadvantage on you because you have to catch up to the uh, same difficulty level as any other one, any other peer at Harvard, right? Um, and so on, on that level, um, not having the best reading skills, not having the best writing, you know, backgrounds, that is um, a day to day disadvantage. Um, but then again, on the long term, I think being undocumented, um, things like traveling. So you have opportunities to travel a lot at Harvard. Mm. You can take, you know, semesters abroad. You can take, you know, vacations abroad. 
And Harvard really welcomes that sort of transformative experience, utilizing the, you know, the world as a sort of global platform. And um, so you kind of miss out on those opportunities uh, from a so social, exp uh, you know, perspective. You know, sometimes friends want to um, go some go to you know some vacation spot internationally. You know, go to Canada, go to Mexico, go to Europe or something just for vacation purposes. And um, and when they invite you, you um, you know either they're already cognizant and so they're like, oh, actually, you know, um, sorry about that, or um, you have to let them know. And so those little things, I think. Yeah, are, tell me about, are there any conversations that you can remember recently with friends that, you know, a quick story maybe of like somebody that you talked to and you had that kind of conversation? You know, what did that conversation, what was that like? Like, how did that go? So um, I'm the thing about myself is that I'm, I'm a, currently a very vocal um, activist for um, undocumented students, and um, I'm a lot more comfortable about talking about my status uh, when meeting new people. Um, uh, so I'm, I don't have as much difficulty uh, compared to some other, you know, undocumented students. But um, I do remember, um, you know, when my roommates and I, we were planning what to do over spring break or what to do um, over summer break uh, together in sort of a recreational event. Um, you know, they offered to go abroad. Um, and then I kind of had to say, oh, man, I can't go. Um, and, and they said, oh, yeah, um, totally. Like, we understand. I'm sorry about bringing that up. And then all my friends tried to accommodate that. And now we're planning to go, um, you know, do like a trip on the East Coast rather than trip abroad. So, so yeah, something like that sometimes happens. I'm wow, sure. that's really cool. Give me a sense of, I'm just curious to know, like what it feels like. Do you feel like you ha you're having a different experience or does it feel really similar to, you know, like in other words, do you feel like just a regular college kid or do you walk around feeling like my experience is different and that's like, you know, something that's with you or, you know, what's what's it like? I'm just trying to get a sense of like, even the feeling, especially like within the last few months, like I don't know what has thing have things shifted for you personally since since you know the election. Wow, that I think I I can take probably months trying to answer that question, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know. But to just make it brief, um, walking around for me personally, you know, it's not something that is salient all the time. I mean, I for sure I try to live as a normal, you know, Harvard student life as I can. Um, and I think for me, it's a little bit different because I started to embrace my status as a form of empowerment, as a form of a statement, um, and definitely something that I wrap my career around. And so, you know, I constantly utilize my status and um, face my status as something inherently part of me. Um, and it's, it's something that I've embraced, uh, especially um, in the past two years at Harvard. And therefore, um, it's not something that's scary or it's not something unwarranted. I know that other um, students who are undocumented who do not really want anything to be a part of, um, uh, uh, for their legal status to be a part of them, um, can feel different about that. Uh, but as for me, I, I feel like, um, you know, all of the extracurriculars that I do, um, my my prospective career passions are are all interconnected with my legal status. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my legal status is just another part of me that um, I can make salient whenever I can and um, whenever I don't want it. And so it has become a part of me rather than something that I carry around and it's a burden. Um, yeah. What was that transition like for you? Like what, what shifted from where you said it was like two years ago that you started to really embrace that? What mm -hmm. was that? change like for you? Why, why do you think that shift happened? And what was that? So, um, you know, I guess I can best describe it when, uh, as I was an uh, undocumented high school student, um, you know, I was a regular high school student doing normal things, except my legal status was sort of this um, shadowy, Im you know, imposing figure that was there that I can't really reach, nor can I really uh, change. Um, you know, my legal status was something that I had no control over um, because, um, you know, it was all politics uh, in my eyes. And 
um, whatever I did in high school. I just knew that some, some, in some way my legal status might or might not get in the way of the things that I want to do. And so it was very uncertain. Um, now, I guess at Harvard, you know, it, all of the uncertainties is still there um, legally and just circumstantially by the way of politics work. But instead of it, instead of letting um, it being shadowy and not, not controllable, uh, I made a part of myself as in, you know, whenever um, people introduced each other um, and on a more personal level, you know, people would just say their name, where they come from, what they study and all that. But I would also include my immigration status. And that was a very bold move that, um, you know, many undocumented students don't yet feel comfortable doing. But I did it in order for me to challenge myself that um, if I can make a statement externally, then I, and it, it could also be a statement internally within myself um, that it is a part of me. Yeah. What is that statement? Um, it's a statement that I have um, experienced experiences that are unique to me, uh, but also um, common around the other, um, you know, 11 million plus people around the country. Um, you know, just like how individuals might say, I'm from Los Angeles, I'm from New York, I'm from, you know, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, you know, you say something in order to sort of describe where you're from, describe your experiences. Um, and I say that, you know, and I'm an undocumented student or I'm a DACA student uh, because other individuals around the nation can share that experience, mm -hmm. uh, but also it encapsulates a lot of experiences and qualities that you've built with that sort of um, identifier. Yeah. I want to hear more about, in a few minutes, I want to have you share a little bit more about what that, some of those experiences have been, even in high school and before that. I want to just make sure our listeners understand what DACA is. Can you just explain briefly what that is? Yes. So um, DACA stands for uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It was, a, uh, it was an executive order um, that was um, enacted by President Obama back in 2012. And what it uh, allows for is uh, for certain undocumented youth uh, with, you know, certain restrictions um, to have uh, protection from deportation, um, but also uh, work authorization, along with the ability to obtain a social security number, you know, driver licenses, and other things that uh, most citizens need in order to live a productive, uh, functional life in the U.S. And mm -hmm. so... Um, now, the current state of DACA is that it can be challenged and, um, you know, repealed by now President Trump anytime that he wants. And so um, DACA, which uh, 700,000 youth across the nation benefit from right now, um, is, you know, up for um, repeal. And so it is a very hot and intriguing topic. Um, now, this is not to um, get mixed up with undocumented fully undocumented youth um, who don't have those protections and privileges um, of DACA. And so um, the other uh, undocumented uh, youth out there, which is more the majority, um, you know, don't have any of those privileges. And so um, it is a very, very difficult experience being an undocumented immigrant overall. And what happens? What happens if DACA is repealed? What happens, you know, personally for you? And I'm just curious, you're theory or your like supposition mm -hmm. about like what might happen nationally yeah um so um just externally not internally first of all uh, a lot of things can happen um just primarily um it would you know um add seven uh, seven hundred thousand plus undocumented youth uh within the population that is um target uh, is targetable for deportation and that's very dangerous because many of those youth are you know intermingled within the American, the fabrics of American society, whether that is education systems, you know, college students, high school students, but also people who have started companies, people who have, um, who are working right now in big businesses. Um, so it's very, very scary for those individuals to be subject to deportation, um, let alone just um, not able to participate in the workplace that they've rightfully earned. Um, because their work authorization will then be repealed. So that's primary. Um, and also externally, too, is that the it just strikes down 
the perspective uh, hopeful re edu uh, immigration reform and a pathway to citizenship for undocumented youth and undocumented immigrants. DACA was kind of a um, one step forward uh, to protect undocumented immigrants, but without that, uh, we're taking one step back. And so, you know, we are now farther away from immigration reform if it is repealed. I guess mm. on an internal level, you know, if DACA is repealed, um, I will be joining the other 20 un undocumented students at Harvard who don't have DACA. And um, what that entails is that, you know, our, it's really uncertain because where do we work after college? Um, what what you happens? Work, you work now, by the way? Uh, yes, I currently work um, at the, um, at, at, with Harvard's administration. Uh, I could get into that um, later, but um, so without DACA, um, I wouldn't be able to um, have the same access to work um, employment opportunities on campus and off campus. Mm -hmm. um, and just after college, you know, what would happen? That's the big question that is profound and very, very scary. Yeah. What was it like? I'm just curious on election night for you. Did you watch the returns? Were you, or were you, mm -hmm. what was, what was it like? Even those in the couple of days leading up to it, and the couple of days after. Right. So, um, what, so I lead an organization on campus called Act in a Dream. Um, we, uh, we are a organization on campus that advocates for immigration reform and also tries to create a community on campus for immigrants. And on election night, um, I have helped organize a um, election watch party, uh, sort of a safe space for undocumented immigrants on campus to watch the election, be with other individuals who can empathize, and um, just um, sort of uh, have a safe space for discussion, whatever the outcome may be. Now, it was one of the most tense uh, moments of my life because, you know, on the screen was someone who can destroy our lives and the fate of our families, right? And it was very, very scary for all of us. Um, but for me personally, I took around, you know, three hours just um, trying to digest that information personally, you know, taking walks outside, you know, shedding a couple of tears. But I just knew that I have to step, I had to step up to support my fellow peers in the room. Um, and so I tried, I made sure that everyone um, got home safely, were able to talk to their families and just rest from a very, very tense um, night of just, you know, feeling very uh, scared about everything. Mm -hmm. And I took a week or two off um, trying to digest everything and, uh, you know, trying to think of my next steps. And so the election night was a pivotal turning point of last semester and perhaps for my entire, for my life. Um, and yeah, it still has a lot of repercussions to this day about what I'm doing and what I want to do in the future. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine. I mean, just trying to put myself in that position and, and, and feel what that might feel like. Um, what makes you so brave? Like, why are you so willing to, to share your status? What gives you courage? I think what gives me my courage is um, externally, I'm not alone. Um, you know, there are so many undocumented youth out there, um, equal and even with more capacity of being amazing activists and vocal um, proponents for immigration reform. And so for me, you know, I am just another um, activist trying to do my part um, in, by being vocal. And, you know, externally, I definitely believe in the ability for a cultural shift to occur, you know, within the mindsets of Americans to reconsider defining what American means. And, um, you know, I feel like for me, being vocal about my status is one way for us to create this sort of culture of questioning what immigration means to us and questioning what legality uh, means to us. Uh, but internally, I think... Um, you know, all of my courage uh, to speak up comes from the sacrifices that my parents has, have, have made in order for me to be here. Um, you know, with every word that I speak and every step that I take, um, you know, it's, it derived, it was, it's derived from the, in, the, uh, in the sweat and the tears that my parents shed um, leading up to my college years. And so um, I just know that 
I have to believe in myself in order uh, for whatever I want to do um, to happen. And so I think on those ends, that's how I really um, derive my uh, all the qualities that I have today. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, you know, what... Well, what, I know this question, the answer to this question already, but what did you choose to write your college essay on? I know that's a leading question, but <laughs> one that I have to ask. Yeah. Um, so I had to write um, two, es two essays um, for Harvard. Um, my main essay um, was basically about my, my uh, immigrant story and experience, um, you know, coming, uh, being a biracial, um, half Japanese, half uh, Filipino kid in um, in Japan, um, immigrating. Uh, with Do you have parents. it nearby? Would you be down to share it with us? Yes, definitely. So the uh, the prompt was: um, some students have a background or story that is so central to their identity, and um, please, basically, please share your story. Um, ose ose ose. I scolded myself with the Japanese words meaning push push push. As I tried to keep up with the pace in the morning run, a tree snagged my foot and I plummeted into the mud. Blood dripped down my knees. The other kids roared in laughter and left me behind. I was the only overweight kid in the kindergarten of my hometown of Shizuoka. A year later, I moved to the U.S. and walked into my elementary school with my only English vocabulary consisting of the word hello. I spent days trying to figure out the words of, for the Pledge of Allegiance. How can I memorize all of those crazy words? The changes were overwhelming, and I wanted to reject them. But I knew I had to adapt. I managed to become fluent in English in three months and rise as a shining student of my second grade class. Over time, I realized I carried the responsibility of being the first one in my family to go to the university. And so I became determined to reach higher education. However, I never found a stable home. Being undocumented, my family and I constantly moved from house to house, city to city, following the path of available jobs while being locked with constant financial struggle. I often found myself sleeping in the houses of relatives while my parents were off in distant cities trying to make ends meet. Cases of financial and legal problems between my fa parents and my relatives left me homeless at one point, leaving me no choice but to live for, with a friend for three months to finish the second grade. The pace of change seemed too fast to keep up. When choosing a high school to attend, I came across a very new school, Panorama High School, which was largely disliked by middle school teachers and students due to its lack of competitive academic programs and a reputation for gang involvement. Despite the common word, I saw how the school was criticized by people who put no effort into improving the campus and its community. How can a school become great without anyone taking action? I realized that the school was just like my childhood self in Japan, in a sense that it was looked down upon and left behind. I wanted to do something. I took the most rigorous classes the school was able to offer and tried to influence the school's prestige as a student, no matter how trivial it seemed. I was going crazy when I was voted to be the first president of the school's first honor society and when I scored the highest SAT score in the history of the campus. As my team and I won the first varsity swimming league championship, the kid trying to memorize the Pledge of Allegiance became the swimmer Stream, scre screaming his team chant before the battle. That's when I knew I was part of this country and that this country was a part of me. More importantly, my experiences at Panorama High School opened my eyes about social change. What can I do for the other immigrants, this country, or the world? I became passionate about studying government and set my sights on becoming a lawyer and one day a politician. Right now, the debate regarding comprehensive immigration reform intrigues me the most. Should this country enact a law that guarantees a safe path for citizenship upon residing undocumented immigrants? Who knows? But this country won't know unless we make the initial leap for change. I see my childhood self in this country, for I believe that it is rejecting the intimidating and round-the-clock changes of the current decade. 
but my current self, but like my current self, we must embrace those changes and prevent people from being left behind in the mud. Great things can truly begin with a little ose, ose, ose. Wow, I got goosebumps. Man, what a powerful story. I haven't looked at that obviously in like two years, but the moment, so a colleague of mine, Park Muth, who's going to be a guest on the podcast, he says something like, you know, great essays have like a perfect line in them. And to me, the perfect line in this essay is the moment when you recognized that the school externally was a representation of your former internal self. And you've been talking about external internal in a really interesting way in this interview. And that recognition to me is that like moment of insight that just like explodes in my mind and really takes this thing to the next level. Um, wow. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Tell me, what was it like? What was it like writing this essay? How many drafts did you write? How long did it take you to write it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was very um, just detail oriented and I wanted to write a great essay. Um, I went through so many drafts. Um, I know Ethan's well aware that I went through like, I, I, I definitely remember counting more than 20 drafts of, of my personal essay. Mm -hmm. um, and on this, with like a span of like nine, six months, like just going crazy over the essay. Um, so it took a lot of time. I definitely know that um, it might take definitely a lot less time for <laughs> a quality <laughs> essay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, when did you know? When did you know you were done with the essay? Um, I don't think you never really know if you're done with the essay. <laughs> I mean, for me, um, I just wrote this essay, and I just felt it was the most comprehensive about myself. Um, I just, I tried a lot of different styles, writing more artistically, writing more, um, you know, in a different format, more challenging format, or something different. But I. Uh, remember retorting back to like my first you know great draft um so you know one of my first great drafts it was very similar to my final draft that i have right now um and i remember really late in the writing process that um you know what i initially thought was great was what it is and um i kind of stuck to that format of just being true to myself about my story mm -hmm. Why did you choose to open with these the first few words? Oh say, oh say, oh say. And what does um, that mean? Tell what you tell the tell everybody what that means. So uh, it means push, push, push in Japanese, and um, I, I wanted to start with it because um, you know, for one, it was it, it literally what I was telling myself back then, um, you know, and and two, it, it really just opened up with a sort of descriptor about myself, um, you know, being Japanese, uh, being some, someone that um, is trying to constantly push myself to do things um, and challenge myself. Um, and third, I think um, it was a very fascinating parallel between pushing myself and also pushing the country that I was in, pushing other things externally. Um, and all of that kind of, um, you know, w were in consideration when I wrote that. I just got chills again. That's, it's such a powerful and in a way simple opening, you know, it was just three words, three words repeated, but it's so effective. And I think, you know, I really love it. And, and I love that you come back to it at the end too, as a sort of refrain, it becomes like a theme for the essay, push, mm -hmm. push, push. There's also, because I'm a dad now, you know, I have a two-year-old baby. I'm thinking of being in the birthing room and having hearing the doctor and the <laughs> nurses say to my wife, push, push, push. And, <laughs> and you're probably not aware of this, but it's having that resonance for me as, wow. as a kind of giving birth to something new, you know? So as a, as a reader, as a listener, it has even more resonance, you know, that you, I, I don't imagine you were aware of like, you know, working that in, um, yeah. but with mm -hmm. something so specific and so simple like that, you know, it can just ripple out. Right. Um, I mean, being like a second year college student and reading back to what I submitted for the college that I'm in, it's a really interesting, and surreal experience. Yeah. What's that like? Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because I really feel like I haven't lost that side of me. Um, and, you know, obviously the narrative has not continued. This was merely what I wrote seems like only chapter one of now many chapters that I have lived through. Um, and, but the theme about my story to this day and w with all the additional chapters that have not, have not been written, I still feel like 
there is a certain theme that's going that's going through it and it's really surreal and very uh, profound to think about that and what is that that theme is it are you talking about the theme that i mentioned or is it something else um i guess yeah like just the theme about um sort of challenging myself and you know pushing myself and um right. these parallels within my life about finding change within myself and finding change outside of um, myself and in the world that I live in. And yeah. Wow. What, what are you, what did you do really well in the application process and what do you regret? In other words, what would you have done differently? So some advice to, this is advice to all the students out there listening. What do you think you really nailed and what do you think you screwed up or would have done differently? Right. Um, I think what I really nailed was, um, so for me personally, the application, the college application process was, you know, not only pushing me to um, challenge myself and kind of open up a new world for college. It was really opening up a world within inside, within myself. Um, you know, you don't really get to, um, as, a, as a teenager going through this experience, I haven't really self-reflected much. Um, and I have never really given myself that opportunity to do so. And so the best thing that I feel like I nailed was taking a step back, finding these themes throughout my life, connecting these dots and creating a narrative within myself that um, I can make it salient and I could carry it with me like a sort of, you know, book about my life that is currently being written. And it was powerful. So that sort of self-reflection process is what I definitely recommend students to um, kind of um, integrate within this process, not seeing it as sort of plug and chug, you know, equation, but mm -hmm. a sort of like its own story that you're like a unique story that you're writing for yourself, that you're sharing with someone. And, um, before you get yeah. to the second part, give me some, give us some tips or things that you remember from that time. Like, you know, how, when did you start, you know, what, what were certain things along the way that were like crucial for, you know, for your development as it were, like what, what helped, what worked for you? Um, so I guess tangibly, I remember taking your exercises like the, um, you know, object exercises, values exercises that really kind of set the tone um, according to how I should be able, how, how I should be looking at things. Um, it's not about the list of accomplishments or the list of, you know, extracurriculars and stuff. It was about the motivations that kind of, um, kind of fueled or stemmed that rooted everything that is on the surface. And I think kind of thinking of it from that perspective, you know, um, not just seeing the face value of what you want to talk about, but seeing the reasons and um, all of the intangible things that goes into what led up to that. I think that uh, those exercises helped us so much. Um, from there, you know, I think just uh, trying to analyze patterns, trying to analyze, um, you know, Although you might not be conscious of the things that you're you're doing throughout childhood, there definitely is, uh, and there was a reason why you did those things. And so, kind of reflecting a lot, you know, talking to your parents about, you know, what happened about, you know, in certain moments in your life in which you might have forgotten, you know, everything is connected. And mm -hmm. so that is sort of kind of the steps I took. I want to jump in and say to the listener that, oh, by the way, Daishi still also did have, he said, you know, you said that it wasn't about the GPA and the test scores and activities, but also <laughs> Daishi did happen to have <laughs> a really great GPA and great test scores. And everybody's out there wondering like, what were they? I don't, you don't, don't you don't have to tell us. Um, but I'll just okay. say, you know, from having worked with them that he had an awesome, I mean, you were ranked, you know, towards the top of your class, right. And had the mm -hmm. highest, you know, test score that your school had ever seen and had some really interesting activities including this thing that we mentioned earlier that I, I'd love for you to just tell us the story real quick about what happened with your counselor because this ended up becoming your second essay, correct? Yes. Um, so I have it with me. I don't know if that should be read or not. Um, Feel free to, I mean, if you want, just tell us the story. We'd, I'd love to yeah. just hear it. What Maybe I can like post a link to it so people can hear it. I'll put it in the show notes. Awesome. Um, so essentially um, my high school um, was a very new high school um, in a very disadvantaged location. Um, the administration uh, was more focused on, you know, helping s students graduate. And because of lack of funding for counselors, um, although a counselor may have had college counselor as a 
subtitle from uh, upon the list of responsibilities, no one really acted as a college counselor. No one really helped college or students reach higher education. And so um, I remember in junior year, in the beginning of junior year, when, you know, there were talks of, you know, DSAT being like a thing, you know, no one knew what that was. Um, you know, everyone just heard that there was going to be, um, you know, registration, but no one knew what the test was about. No one knew how to take it. Um, it was a very profound and very, very, um, also scary experience, um, hearing an announcement that, Hey, this counselor has SAT fee waivers, come pick it up. Uh, but no one had a, a single clue about what they were doing. Um, so I, I, I explicitly remember there was a line to pick up these fee waivers to take this test, um, you know, because, uh, most of the students can't afford to pay the full amount. Um, and in this line, you know, people got the fee waivers and they were told to register to take the test, but um, no one knew anything. And, but, you know, when I saw that and I was in the line, um, I knew I had to do something. And um, I was one of the only students who had prior experience with taking the SAT um, early on. And so um, I just hopped out of line and, you know, I stepped up and I helped every student apply to um, a register for the SAT uh, with those fee waivers and things like that. And that really initiated a very interesting um, sequence of events uh, as taught throughout the junior and senior year. Um, I started to help students um, with other college things. And eventually the head counselor um, at, my, at my school recognized that. And because there wasn't, you know, um, uh, I guess a de facto counselor who did all this job. Um, she she put me as an official um, student position, um, sort of like a student college counselor, in order to um, help students in the long run. And so that was sort of my extracurricular that was started. And wow. um, yeah. It's so awesome. And the ending to your essay, the way you phrase it, I won't spoil it. I encourage folks to listen to it, to take a look at it and read it. It's It's got a really great ending and it, 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 you do a really nice job of, of tying things up in, in a really succinct way too. Like I think it ended up being, you know, like 350 words. Uh-huh, um, yeah. yeah, because your, your main essay I think was 650. So, and what, you know, just to kind of let people in on what you were saying earlier about the UCs, this was when the University of California had two essays that were a thousand words, you know, it's changed now, but it allowed you to show, well, let me ask you, like, why did you choose to talk about these two topics, you know, of all the things that you could write about? And secondly, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what it was like to, in a way, come out in your essay, you know, to, to, right. to yeah. basically, yeah, to talk about your undocumented status. So maybe the first one, why did you pick those two topics? And then what, what was like the, what was the decision like to come out as mm-hmm. it were? Okay. So one, um, I chose these topics. Uh, well, the first topic being a, a holistic narrative about, um, my life, uh, because I want to give the, um, admission officer a full picture of everything that, um, you know, culminated within my years uh, being an undocumented student, being a student in a new country, being an immigrant. Um, I really wanted to sort of uh, give that perspective that they haven't seen uh, before because usually you don't get much undocumented students applying to these colleges. Um, And so I really wanted to be explicit about that. Um, And two, uh, or or sorry, with my second essay that is about the college thing, uh, are the being a college, student college counselor, I wanted to show that I can step up to the plate. I, um, although the intangible qualities of being undocumented and being an immigrant can shine, I wanted to really show that like on a merit basis that I have those initial qualities to step up to the plate, um, challenge myself, um, and have a lot of sort of, um, I guess academic and professional qualities in order for me to be distinguished as an applicant. Um, And so that sort of personal, but both also professional sort of perspectives I wanted to integrate, uh, which is why I chose those topics. Right. That's, and I I thought it was really smart. Um, I remember when we first talked about that, it, it showed in some sense, the first essay showed about who you are and the second essay talked about what you've done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really nice balance that, it wasn't, and, and neither one is so poetic. Like there are definitely poetic elements in both of them, but mm-hmm. both were also pretty informational, which which I really liked actually. 
Right. Um, I mean, I definitely uh, tried writing new drafts that were a lot more poetic and sort of, uh, I remember some of those yeah. I was like I remember reading them and going like what's going on here like, I don't even <laughs> understand what's happening anymore um, but I and I really appreciated that you were you know iterating and you know writing and rewriting and trying to find the the voice and it ended up just coming out beautifully just so authentic and so you know it's just like you talking and as I hear you read it I'm like oh yeah that sounds like Daishi talking that's something that I think was really <laughs> Um, you really nailed too. Tell me about coming out. In, yeah. And I know I keep using this term. I don't know if it feels that way for you, but mm-hmm. what was that experience like and that process, that mental process like for you? And also, would you recommend it to other students? That can kind of be like a thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess with the, re- the reason why I included in, t- in my uh, first essay primarily was because being undocumented was a huge part of my personal story, you know? A personal statement is about you and and being undocumented being um you know that having that sort of status defined um and set a lot of undertones within my own story you know showing the circumstances in which i had to make certain decisions um thus i just thought it was necessary for me to pl- uh, put that in there and sort of come out to the admission officer um but also one of the reasons why is because i knew that the admissions officer who is looking or reading this app, uh, these all these applications um, must want to see different perspectives about the world and must want to have students who can provide these unique experiences to contribute to their campus. Um, you know, so you know, although throughout my life I always thought being undocumented was something that held you back. In this circumstance, it was a way for me to use it as something that is going to push me forward. Um, you know, all of it really was, uh, you know, a moment for me to embrace. It was a start of me embracing my status as something that can help me. That's something that is powerful for me. Um, and mm. yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons. And when it comes to other students or those who are uh, listening. Yeah. What um, do you say to those? First of all, yeah. beautifully put, I love what you just said. And secondly, like, what do you say to those, those students out there who are listening and going, I'm kind of afraid and they're a little worried, especially now, you know, is there, is there reason for them to be afraid in coming out in their college essay as undocumented? Um, so I, I would say that definitely if it's such an integral part of your story, if it's an integral part of who you are, you should definitely put it in there. And, and, and even if you don't think it has had a lot of repercussions in your life, maybe, or it has a lot of impact, um, it, might have had so please think about it reflect upon it and see how it uh, could have intermingled within uh who you are today and i highly recommend students to put it on in their personal statement despite whatever is going on in the world because um for the most part college campuses are all focused with this objective of trying to enrich their campus with different perspectives trying to gather students who are talented enough to overcome challenges and um students who can you know, use those skills of overcoming challenges to overcome further challenges and solve problems in the world. I mean, I really can't emphasize enough how much I recommend students are putting it um, in their applications. Uh, when it comes to certain colleges around the nation and being mindful of that, I mean, I still think for all colleges, uh, most of the admissions officers are very mindful that there are undocumented youth across the nation who are applying. And therefore, I still recommend uh, putting it in there. Tell us about the day you got in. What was that like? Wow, that was... <laughs> I still get chills um, thinking about it. Um, and we I have a recording of it, so I still get chills watching it sometimes. Um, but basically, um, I, get, I have gathered um, my closest friends um, and I invited them into my home um, uh, with my parents. And we had sort of like... Uh, opening letter party type thing. Uh, you know, we had food and it was nice. And we, when we started opening the letters, I applied to five other IV uh, or four other IV schools besides Harvard. Um, and I remember that all of them had different application portals and I didn't, it was hard for me to remember all the usernames and passwords. So <laughs> it was <laughs> very difficult for me to open up all of them um, electronically. Uh, but I remember opening up you know, for example, Brown uh, University's letter and I was rejected. And then I remember opening up, you know, Columbia rejection, Princeton rejection, Yale, then like rejection. 
and then the last one, which was Harvard. Um, and I made that last because, you know, Harvard has always been my dream campus. And um, all of my friends and my family knew that was my goal. And so when I logged into the portal, I, it was like I had no trouble logging in. So that was one first like sign that it was going to be OK or something. And then when I click continue and it said, like, congratulations, welcome to Harvard 2020 or 2019. And just went, we just went crazy. The roof shook. We were all screaming and crying. And I just looked to my parents and they had this look and I felt the feeling of this expression, which illustrated how everything was worth it. All the sacrifices, all the pain, all of the bad memories, all col like culminated and flourished something beautiful. And it, it was just, everything was just worth it. And it was a moment of my life that was transformative um, and it opened up a new door um, into something that, a world in which I have never expected. Um, yeah, it was an amazing night. Wow. <laughs> I remember getting an email from you, all caps, you know. Ethan, I got into Harvard, and it was like all the way across my screen. I don't remember where I was, but I just remember like tears in my eyes and like showing my wife and like us having us, uh, probably not the same moment, but kind of a, a mini roof comes off moment. Just so excited for you. And it's, yeah, it's still such a trip to like think back to that. Does it feel real now to be do you feel like okay i'm definitely in this or do you still sometimes feel like is it still like you know because i imagine that it would be kind of you, you mentioned it was kind of surreal does it do you still have surreal moments or is it still does it feel now like okay this is my life uh, i mean i think it has already sunk sunk in for me yeah. um and it's really a huge part of my life um and but it took a while for it to uh get this way um you know definitely last year as a freshman um, it always felt surreal. Um, it always felt like, wow, I'm at Harvard. But also it always felt like, wow, I'm at Harvard from a negative standpoint, like I don't belong here or, um, you know, it's not, I'm not necessarily um, fully, I guess, integrated within the fabric of Harvard history yet. And so it felt a little bit foreign sometimes last semester or last year, that is. But now as a sophomore you know as in this in his second semester i feel uh my friend told me something be, uh, over this past winter break that kind of changed my outlook about how i view about myself about in harvard he told me that you know now that we're you know second semester sophomores you do realize that we're no longer um looking to be this harvard standard anymore we are harvard you know, whatever Harvard is to the world, we define that through our actions mm -hmm. as, you know, sophomores mm -hmm. um, and as upperclassmen. And that really sunk down to this semester that, wow, it doesn't matter um, what I'm doing and if it's, you know, in it, how it compares to the standard of being a Harvard student. Because whatever I'm doing now is the standard, you know, and mm. th so now it really sunk in for me and it's a huge part of my life. That's beautiful. The, I love that you said being part of the fabric of Harvard. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm particularly inspired by your work with Act on a Dream. And I'd love to hear just a little bit more about what the future looks like and how will you lead through Act on a Dream? Yeah. Um, so Act on a Dream is a growing, constantly evolving um, student organization. And um, we advocate for immigration reform and create a community on campus. And, you know, I think we have achieved so much in the past year. Um, Act on a Dream has been around for um, around 10 years now. Uh, it started off being an organization in which students that were iffy about uh, uh, immigration status came together and kind of like talked about it. Um, you know, the status of the way it was run before can be summed, but summed up by the fact that a couple of years ago, um, the co-directors of the organization didn't even know each other were undocumented. You know, it was that sort of tense. It was that sort wow. of, um, you know, the narrative wasn't there uh, before DACA. Now, after DACA, uh, when, you know, students had more of a uh, confidence to talk about their status, 
um, it changed dramatically. Um, it became an organization in which we celebrate being undocumented or we try to emphasize the qualities that we have gained through our experience. Use that sort of, uh, you know, a form of narrative therapy, if you will. Um, trying to uh, utilize all of the negative emotions, all of the bad things that comes with being undocumented and owning up to that and seeing how it, um, we can use it as a tool to empower ourselves. Um, and using that to um, sort of create a culture on campus that um, immigration is a common, natural, beautiful thing um, that everyone can relate to. And so how does it look like? Well, you know, um, in, after the election, it, it now took another sort of um, step in its evolution. Um, the Harvard administration looked to act in a dream as the sole student voice um, in order to implement a lot of support. Um, and other student organization, um, you know, did a lot of the external organizing and external pressure as uh, we played this de facto role um, of sort of being liaisons for the undocumented student voice. And ever since then, through all of the pieces, um, not only with Act in a Dream, but other organizations and other powerful allies, um, you know, we were able to achieve, you know, recently a fellow for undocumented students in the Office, the office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, we've been able to um, uh, con uh, convince administration of establishing the first um, undocumented, or a website, university-wide web website, website dedicated to undocumented students. And, um, you know, may have Memorial Church, which is our main campus church, be a sanctuary, ch sanctuary church, and all these amazing things, um, you know, uh, but all of this led up to a lot of, wow, like tremendous months of advocacy. I remember um, I was leading a group of undocumented students, Act in a Dream and also beyond, um, to have a meeting with Drew Faust, who is the president of Harvard University. Um, and I, I was leading this group um, and we were prepping for it and everything. And then I remember leading them into the office and we sat down with her and we were pushing so hard for a sanctuary campus. And that was one of the most redefining or defining experiences of, you know, of our club, but also myself. And um, all of this advocacy work um, wouldn't have been possible with the amazing people in Harvard who are passionate about this work. And um, that's who, uh, that's what Act in a Dream is. And we'll continue this work um, to use our Harvard voice to advocate for undocumented immigrants and beyond. Amazing. Um, I want to wrap up here in a minute. I just want to hear from you. I, what, what two things? One is uh, what? What did, first of all? What advice would you give to students as they're going through this process? It could be something practical, or it could be something you know uh, intangible. Like what? What would you say to students who are aspiring, not necessarily undocumented or immigrant students, but any students who are going through this college process? Wow. Okay. Um, I think that. Um, you really, really have to believe um, in yourself. Um, it's so hard to do that um, because, you know, obviously the, you always hear about the next best person. Um, you know, you always think about your own, uh, about your insecurities, you know, about the things you don't have. And you always, you end up forgetting the things that you do have and all of the blessings that have led you to this place outside of yourself and within your, in yourself. And so, my biggest recommendation is to, um, you know, really take a step back and really reflect upon everything that culminates you and seeing the amazing qualities that you have and um, using that as a vehicle to believe in yourself for the future growth of who you may be in the future after in college. Um, you know, for me, the application process wasn't a way for me to appeal to the colleges or, um, you know, a plug and chug equation. It was it was this journey um, about ref reflecting upon myself, finding myself um, in order for me to lead into the next chapter of my life. And I highly recommend taking that sort of perspective and then culminating into you seeing all these qualities by yourself to really believe that you can do this and that, um, you know, anything is really possible. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, the human experience is very beautiful. For sure. I love the way you talked about that. Um, I'm curious also to hear, I, you know, I have part of the, 
role of this and the goal of this podcast is to give students and counselors and parents practical resources. And I like to do that through a little segment called Show and Tell. So it's just a chance for mm-hmm. each of us to share one thing that is like a resource that's been meaningful to us, that's meaningful to us in our lives right now, or that's been meaningful in the past. So what have you brought today for, for Show and Tell? <laughs> Right. Um, so today um, I'm bringing in something that I recently just um, uh, got from my boss uh, who I work with. Um, she gave me a, um, a bamboo uh, plant and it is like a little desk plant uh, that I take care of. And it's really awesome because one, I love like bamboo plants in overall in general. But um, I think what it does to me is that it helps me just find balance and growth and peace. Um, You know, as a Harvard student, you know, being really involved in a lot of activism, you do a lot of giving, you do a lot of leading, um, and it's really hard to find some time for yourself. Um, And so um, this plant has given me this sort of kind of calming, tranquil um, atmosphere in my room um, to be more self-reflecting, you know, advice that I definitely is con- I'm constantly trying to take from myself, <laughs> although I'm giving it now, um, and f- find balance and see how that just like this plant, I am growing, and just like this plant, I need water to grow. Um, and yeah, it's been really helping me keep a really nice uh, mental attitude. Wow, I love that. You just changed my show and tell, just listening to um, yours. It makes me think of, so thank you, first of all. That's a brilliant thing. I'm. I want to go get one now. Um, the my show and tell. I'm looking up on my shelf here, and this this is kind of an image sometimes in the background photos on my website. But there's this little singing bowl that um, my good friend Frank Anderson gave to me, and it's actually let me grab it because I want to play it for you. It's really nice. Mm-hmm. Give me one second. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to play it for you. Hopefully I can do it right. It's kind of hard to play. So it's a really simple sound, simple thing. But when I listen to this, I mean, I can like breathe more deeply. I'm noticing my voice is like relaxed a little bit. (laughs) Um, And sometimes I'll just, you know, I'll sometimes use it as a transition in my essay workshops as a nice little, you know, a calmer way than like beeping or blaring. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, here's another resource that I want to share with folks. There's this, um, there was this study done, scientists decided to to test what would be the most like scientifically relaxing sounds and songs. And they found Mm -hmm. if you just Google like most relaxing song ever, I'll put it in the show notes, but there's this (laughs) amazing piece. And I created a little meditation, like an eight minute meditation that um, that I'll put in the show notes. But I've used it with a couple students who've been working to deal with anxiety um, through this process and it's it's just such a beautiful reminder, Daishi. I'm really thankful that you that you brought up the bamboo plant. That that it's sometimes just these little things, right? That can just mm-hmm. give us pause and give us a pause, whether it's during the college application process, in college, or just in life. Um, so thank you for that reminder. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it you know it definitely took um, years of I guess practice and getting used to this idea of. Um, of being trying to um, seek balance and um, valuing mental health as uh, an amazing thing to focus on um, that hasn't really been focused on um, throughout my life. So yeah, it's great. Daishi, thank you. I'm honored and so grateful to spend this time with you. It's great to to hear your voice. It's been a while. So I just I thank you so much for your contributions, not just to this podcast, but to my life and and um, you know what you've meant to me. It's been awesome knowing you and I'm grateful to know you now and to see what you create and manifest in this world. Thank you so much. I mean I really can't um, you know, 
um, emphasize how much you have been an amazing mentor to me and uh, such an amazing resource. Um, and definitely without you, I wouldn't have been able to open that um, of this new chapter at Harvard um, that has fundamentally changed um, the course of my life. And so i um, really grateful for this opportunity to just come back to, to you, your voice, and um, all of this amazing narrative that um, has led me to the place I am today. And to those who are viewing, I, you know, thank you so much for listening and I'm very honored. And um, I'm definitely a, another resource um, and you have a definitely a friend at Harvard. Wow. What a generous offer. That, I'm gonna, now I'm going to ask you if I can put your email and your contact info yeah. <laughs> in the show notes. Yeah. That's, a, that's a really generous offer. And thank you for, for being that resource. And I, I have, um, I'll just let the listeners know, there are two resources that I'm, putting together now. And I'd love Daishi, I'd love your help, you know, putting together a couple resources on number one, should I come out in my essay, which we've kind of already answered. And two, if I do decide to come out in my essay, how do I do it? Um, so that's mm -hmm. something that, that folks can listen to. And we'll, I'll link to that in the show notes or they can, you know, check that out. So thank you again. And, um, yeah, have an awesome week. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. And yeah, everyone have an amazing start of your week. That's the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you've got a moment, please leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. And if you've got feedback, I'd love to hear from you. So you can email me at info at collegeessayguy.com. As always, stay curious. Stay curious.